everybody. It's Alex Krichuan again with HRN. Um, again, I'm uh, Alex Krichuan. I'm the director for Advanced Lung and Heart Disease. Uh, where we're, we're HRN, where we do the virtual pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation done through telehealth. Um, and yes, it is covered by insurance, just in case. <laughs> so topics uh, that we're going to go over today is why is it important to keep my house clean if I have COPD? Okay, and how can different environmental exposures affect someone's breathing? Is there a, a better urban environment for someone that struggles to breathe in? So these were common questions that were brought up. So we're going to be discussing some of those questions, um, if not all of them. Uh, by the way, if you want to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, we would very much appreciate that. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, as I'm doing um, this presentation, if you have any questions, please write in the comment section. I'll be happy to, uh, to go over any of those questions and see if we find any types of resolution uh, to those questions. OK, so house cleanliness. Um, we found that 60% of the people that return back and forth to the hospital, um, their house, even though it may look spotless, we found that their home was causing them the biggest problem as far as an exacerbation goes. So uh, let's talk really briefly about an exacerbation. An exacerbation, a COPD exacerbation, or just an exacerbation by itself, just, uh, just the word is a heightening of current symptoms. So if you already suffer through increased work of breathing, congestion, uh, anything like that, you're going to have a heightening of those symptoms. That's what uh, an exacerbation is. Okay, uh, COPD exacerbation it just goes without saying it's a heightening of current symptoms. So we found 60% of the people that return back and forth to the hospital, their home was causing them the problem. Uh, we found that duct work, uh, that the people's duct work, like their filters for their air conditioner or heater, uh, like the furnace, uh, their filters weren't changed on time. Uh, or they were never changed for at least quite some time and the filters were all blocked up. And with the moisture in the home and, and mold build up, every time that person turns on the air conditioner heater, that just circulates throughout the, uh, the, uh, uh, throughout the home. And those particles are so micron, they're so small in size, that you can't really see them with naked eye. So you don't even realize that you're breathing in potentially hazard uh, things. So step one, if you feel, if you're the type of person that is going to the hospital with an exacerbation, let's say every month, or maybe more often than every month, uh, which is a very bad sign, um, I, would I would suggest or I would recommend a mold test inside the home, just a simple mold test. Uh, you can actually purchase them from, you know, from like Lowe's, Home Depot, I'm pretty sure on Amazon as well. And you would actually just put the test, you know, read the instructions and, and uh, set up the test in your home. And uh, depending on the type of test, you probably have to wait a day and then it will, de it will show you or you have to send your sample over to a company. It all depends on which one you buy. Well, some of them you can actually get the determination of the test, like right then and there. But uh, but some of them you actually have to mail them in to a company where they do a culture screening on them to see what type of microbe or what type of mold or if it's hazardous or not for you. We're good. We're good. Okay. So uh, mold test would be the first thing. If if you're the type of person that's returning back and forth to the hospital very often, let's say more than a month or a month, uh, every month you go to the hospital, then yes, you, you definitely want to do a mold check inside your home. Don't try to clean the mold yourself if you see that. Uh, now, remind you that um, also other environmental exposures, um, household cleaners, if you're using a lot of household cleaners that the fumes are very intense, it might be pretty difficult to breathe throughout that. And if you're kind of got used to that smell of, you know, ammonia and not pneumonia, but ammonia and let's say other harsh fragrances, uh, it doesn't mean that's completely great for you. Okay. So a like a lot of people, they don't realize that they can be a professional lousy sleeper, for instance. And what do I mean by that? 
the person is so used to not sleeping very well throughout the night that they feel that that's their normal. And when I asked that person, how well do you sleep at night? And they said, oh, I sleep very well. I said, okay. I said, so you sleep very well. Uh, do you wake up at all throughout the night? Yeah, but that's normal. I said, okay. Um, have you slept for eight hours at least? He says, no, I usually sleep about an hour a night, but I, I've been doing that. That person is a professional lousy sleeper, meaning that person is so used to their symptoms that they feel that that's their normal, and that is not normal. Okay. So that was a question on there replying to Donna. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Uh, replying to Lisa. Um, so mold buildup. Uh, now, well, let's just get off the mold really quick. Let's just talk about our home, for instance. If you are a person who just stopped smoking, one of the best things you could ever do, and that's part of the weaning protocol for coming off of cigarettes, is to clean your home completely. And then letting anybody else that usually would come in and smoke inside your home to not do that anymore, of course. And, um, you know, you have, of course, rights to ask. You know, and uh, like I would never allow anybody to come my home and smoke cigarettes inside my home. So, uh, you know, letting people know before you come over, just letting you know that I haven't smoked, you know, just like explaining to your family or friends or neighbors um, that you stop smoking. There is no smoking allowed on my property anymore. You know, just not being mean, but just being uh, preventative, uh, prophylactic, you know, thinking uh, in the future. But as soon as you stop smoking, let's say, um, the fir very first thing you want to do is get rid of that smell of cigarette, right? That's that ashtray smell. So getting rid of that is you want to clean the home or have a professional uh, cleaner come out to clean the home uh, thoroughly, okay? So that's step one. Uh, of course, we talked about uh, mold test, okay? So you do a mold test. If you are, let's say, you know somebody who's a hoarder that doesn't like to throw things away, uh, that, also, that also is uh, very extremely dangerous and hazardous because of the obstacles around your floor and things like that. So cleaning up the home might sound like a big task depending on your situation, like if you're a hoarder or not a hoarder. Um, and mind you, if your home looks very clean, it doesn't mean the duct work, the, the air conditioning heating duct work in your home, you can't see inside that duct work. So it's always a good idea to have a company come out just to check it. There's a lot of uh, uh, home companies like uh, air conditioning companies, uh, servicing companies that will come out for free just to scope your duct work to see if it needs cleaning. And if it does need cleaning, they'll show you evidence, video evidence that this is what it is. Uh, we also did mold cul culture, and we saw there was black mold buildup, whatever the case may be. Um, and then you will, you know, of course, there is a cost if they find something and you, um, and you want them to clean it. You know, there's always a cost to, to that, I would think. But please make sure you don't ever clean it yourself, because if you're immunocompromised, and let's talk about immunocompromised really quick. Are people that have lung disease immunocompromised? Anybody? Yes. Uh, if you're sick, are you immunocompromised? Yes. If you have a flu, are you immunocompromised? Yes. If your body is fighting something else in your body and you bring something else in, you're immunocompromised. That's just how it is. Okay. Uh, see, please settle an arrangement. If, uh, is there a difference between an spirometer and an incentive spirometer? So, a spirometer is a measuring tool because it's a spirometer, right, Karen? Uh, an incentive spirometer is a device used, uh, and the, so there's the, the name of the device. Like, you can say that's a car, right? Uh, but the type of car, it's a Toyota, or it's this or that. I'm not trying to bring up name brands here, but uh, so there's a name brand, but there's the subject. Okay, so the incentive spirometer is the subject. Okay, the maneuver is called an SMI. Uh, it stands for Sustain Maximum Inspiratory, or Inspiration, Inspiratory. Okay, so it measures how much air can come in. So if you say spirometer, 
it can mean all sorts of measuring devices that uh, you can use a spirit that actually measures volume, but an incentive spirometer is more specific. That's in an incentive spirometer. That's something that we would give to a patient. So you wouldn't say spirometer, you would say incentive spirometer. Uh, just, because, just like saying a tachometer, and then you have a nifmanometer. So all these different variations of uh, units of measurements and, the, uh, and what they're called, is, they're all very different. But uh, you, would, you, would, uh, you would say incentive spirometer if you're talking about an incentive spirometer we would use to measure lung volumes. Uh, see, Sandra, how do you tell a old person that likes to hug you and they smell like cigarettes? <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, it's a great question. It's a really great question. So the question is, how do you tell an old person that likes to hug you and they smell like cigarettes? It's horrible that I don't want to hurt uh, no one's feelings. I, I completely agree with you, uh, Sandra. Um, some of the... So there's... Uh, what I usually do is I kind of rip the Band-Aid off. Is, um, you know, uh, I'll just kind of be jokey with it in a sense. So let's say uh, somebody wanted to uh, hug me, you know, and, and they hug me and I smell cigarettes. Well, I'm not going to tell them right there. Maybe I'll, I'll be like on the side. He's like, did you smoke cigarettes? Did you just smoke? And he says, I can really smell it. You know, I'll say something like that, kind of whispering in their ear, did you smoke cigarettes? You know, um, so that's one way. <laughs> I don't think there's, a, uh, the, the, there's necessarily a proper way, but without hurting the person's feelings, I would be jokey about it because anything that you're going to say that will kind of insult them will make it feel like you're, you're attacking that person. So I would actually bring it up as a joke in a, in a way, but with a little seriousness, seriousness in it. Uh, that's what I would say. <laughs> Great question, though. Uh, see, please settle our, oh, no. Uh, see, when do you talk about excise tips and rehab? I can, uh, that's what I'm talking about right now, actually. Um, uh, so uh, rehab, uh, exercise tips. So as, imagine this, okay? Joanne, imagine this, because this was your question. Imagine you're a clinician, okay? You're a, um, a director of pulmonary or, you know, you're a respiratory therapist, and underneath your license you have obligations. Um, and underneath your license you can handle... You know, you, you take on the responsibilities to help patients out. And you, uh, so you have a license that any time that there is uh, anything bad that will happen, it falls underneath your license. That means you're responsible. So if you gave bad information out or you did something bad to it with a patient and you gave them maybe the wrong information or something, it could cause harm. And then that person's license is revoked. It's usually on a suspension, and then it will be reported. I never had anything happen on my license, uh, and of course, it's, it's public information. You can easily go online, go on, on to the Maryland Board of Physicians, and just type in my last name, um, and uh, my first name, but usually just a last name, and it'll bring up my license, but there is no, nothing bad on my license that I have ever done. So you're trying to give tips and tricks for people, right? And out of 10 people, one of them, let's say, passes out and hurts himself and was rushed to the hospital. Then that person, uh, then the doctor or clinician at the hospital says, what happened? He says, I was going over these tips and tricks um, on this video, and um, I, I got injured. So then that hospital like, has to report it because that's, that's their protocol. If there's neglect, if there's something that happened, they have to report it. Okay, so when I give tips and tricks, they're going to be the most basic standard of anything because I don't want to give an advanced tip, something like advanced, like where it monitors heart, where it monitors lung volume, where it monitors this and that, just because you will need a clinician who studied that, who is an expert in their field. Because if you try to give a tip and trick to somebody and they injure themselves because you can't see that person, I don't want anybody getting hurt in this. I don't ever want anybody getting hurt in this. I, I, I just can't 
give extreme tips and tricks, okay? So exercise tips, sure. Rehab tips, sure. Well, we can definitely go over some of those. Um, I always bring up the safety precautions. So just so everyone's well aware, okay? So yeah, I'll bring that up. That's not a problem. Uh, just stay tuned for uh, right now and I'll bring that up in just a second. Let me just go over some of these questions and get off the topic here. Okay, Joanne, no worries. Uh, see, Karen, are you familiar with PEP, buddy? <laughs> yes, positive expiratory pressure. Um, uh, a PEP device is what you mean? Is it, are you talking about, Karen, are you talking about a PEP device? Like the, uh, the expiratory pressure flutter valve PEP device? Like the, there's the Air Physio, there's the VPEP, the Aerobica, Acapella, you know, there's all sorts of them. But uh, I am very familiar with those, of course. Um, that's, that's my field <laughs> and anything with pulmonary. So, um, uh, yes, uh, you would breathe in really deep. You'll breathe out through it. Let me grab one. Let me grab one. Any one that in particular you want to know about? Uh, let me go grab one. That means I would have to jump off camera. Would that be okay for a second? Uh, yeah. Uh, everything should be on the side of the right there. Perfect. Thank you. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Perfect, perfect. Okay. So I have a PEP device right here. This is called a VPEP. Okay. Like I said, there's a lot of variations of different ones. I like the VPEP just because I can take the mouthpiece off, take the top cover off, and take the flutter and actually clean them thoroughly. I can even put them into the dishwasher if I wanted to. And they, it's just like a big key. It actually gets put together, uh, and it's kind of hard to put it together the wrong way, you know. Um, so anyways, on top of the VPAP, you have a resistor. On the, this resistor, it's, uh, it's what we call an aggressor, meaning that when I breathe out through it, let's say I have it, let's say where's my positive sign? There it is, my positive. Okay. So if I push this dial <coughs> away from the mouthpiece, <coughs> excuse me, if I push this, this little lever on top of it, can we get a close-up shot of this? Uh, sure. It goes to your left. There you go. Okay. okay. Sorry, right. <laughs> is it my right? This one, right? Yes. I'm going to right. So there's the lever right here. It's a little slider. I know the picture's a little blurry, I apologize, but there's a little slider right there. So it's just on top of that. On the acapella, it's on the back of the acapella. So let's say I didn't know how to use this, and I breathe in. I exhale. It flutters. Is that all I have to worry about? Well, let's say the aggression of how much it's vibrating your chest is not as aggressive. It needs more oomph. It needs more power. So then I'll increase the resistance on there by moving the slider closer to the mouthpiece. And that will increase the aggression, okay, making the vibrations of my chest more violent. So I breathe in. So the rule of thumb is you want to breathe in as deep as you can. Exhale. Breathe out full breaths. Every 10, time, every 10 breaths you do through this, so every 10, Take it out of your mouth and cough three times. So let's say that was my 10th. I'll take a deep breath in, cough, <coughs> deep breath in again, cough, <coughs> and then repeat it the third time. <coughs> then I will put this back in my mouth. How often is this done? How often is this done? This is done as needed. Usually it's done in the morning. Okay, to kind of set me up for my morning. So uh, it's usually done in the morning or when I take medication. So let's say I take my respiratory medications, I can use this. I can attach a VPEP, uh, the, the VPEP with a T piece on the nebulizer and use the nebulizer in line with this to actually bring in the medication as I breathe it in. And the T piece just goes on the back end of it. You breathe in the medication, you breathe out the congestion. Okay, so, so you'll knock two birds out with one stone. Okay, um, so use this as needed. Uh, if you're somebody who suffers through a lot of congestion, just note 
the, uh, when you are at your worst with that congestion? Is it in the morning? Is it in the evening? Is it in the, in the later afternoon? Whatever it is. If you're more congested in the morning, then use this in the morning. If you're more congested in the evening, use this in the evening. Okay? You will do it about 10, to 10 breaths, 10 times. Uh, the session time should be about 10 minutes. Should be about 10 minutes. Okay? If you still feel there's a lot of congestion still in there, just double check and verify that it is congestion because a lot of people feel like they're congested, but it was just severe inflammation. Okay? But, uh, and how you really know that is you're coughing, but nothing else is coming out. It just feels like it's sliding up, but nothing's coming out for you to cough up. Right? Uh, that might be grade A inflammation. So use, this at, so use a VPAP as needed. Uh, is this as important as using the Delta V? Yes. The Delta V, so it's a good question. It's a, actually a really good question. So VPAPs are to remove congestion. Delta Vs are to strengthen, is to strengthen the muscles for your respiratory system, okay? Uh, so like if I'm working out, I will work out three times, maybe three times a week, right? So when you have a workout tool like a Delta V, like this one, you have a muscle trainer, I would use this every day, if not three times, you know, uh, uh, usually the rule of thumb is six times a day, 10 minutes each. But just like if I'm going to work out, and let's say my lungs are really good, but I want to strengthen them up anyways, uh, and let's pretend I don't have lung disease, I'll do it three times a week. If I have lung disease and my volumes are shot, meaning I don't have, I can't bring in a lot of air into my body, then I'll use a Delta V six times a day, 10 minutes each until my volume is up to a good human level and not a very small animal's volume. What I'm trying to say is, if you're breathing this shallow, like you have lungs this size, versus your lungs are actually this size, so if you're breathing shallow, then I'll use the Delta V until it's up, until your volumes are up to uh, at least half of, uh, that's just 65 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. So you take 65, multiply it, uh, multiply your ideal body weight by 65, but your ideal body weight has to be in kilograms because that's, the, the, that's what the ratio is in. Um, it's based off kilograms, not pounds. So just make sure it's converted to kilograms. So if your ideal body weight is 180 pounds because you're six foot tall or 5'11", um, then you would uh, take 180 divided by 2.2 to put it in kilograms, and that's 81.8. Uh, Multiply 81.8 or 82, just round up, by 65, and that's 5,330. And then you just want to be half of that. So you just divide that in half. That's your minimum. That's your max. So your max is 5,330. If you're my height, like, uh, like I'm six foot tall. So if you're my height, then yes, you want to be at least above 2,500. You know, you, you want to be at least a minimum of uh, 2,500 milliliters uh, at any given time, you know. So I never have congestion unless I'm sick. Yeah, then I wouldn't actually worry about the congestion part. Very good questions. Okay. Can you tell me what is a conspiring device? What is a conspiring device is and how it works? Conspiring device? Which device is that? I gotta have specifics on these. I don't know what you what that question is. Um, what is a, I would like to know what a conspiring, it, that's what it literally says verbatim, conspiring. To conspire, it's, it's a different terminology than, uh, I, I'm not sure what that, I have to skip that question, I apologize. That's from Kay from Virginia Beach. Um, I have to have a better description of what you're talking about. Uh, see, Ricky from Georgia. If you had to stop rehabilitation exercise because of an injury or otherwise, um, how long does it take does it take before you can start regression? So uh, if you're in therapy and you're improving, right? Because that's that's what we always do. We we always improve people. So if you're in therapy and you're improving and you stop, you can go back to square one, uh, meaning um, not yourself, but I mean, uh, 
I don't want to make it vague and confusing, um, ambiguous. I, uh, so I'll, I'll put it like this. Let's say you're in therapy and you get injured and your doctor says you can't exercise for at least a month. After that, you can return back to the program. Um, but it all depends on how fast your injury gets repaired. Okay, so if you're injured and your doctor says wait a month, you gotta wait a month. You got, there's no other direction towards that. You, know, you gotta wait a month, depending on what your doctor says. Um, if your doctor is fine with respiratory muscle exercises, which should always be the case, and it should always be okay with respiratory mu muscle exercises. Um, even if you have rib fractures, respiratory muscle exercising is very, 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 very important. Um, so I would never stop that, but I will also confirm with the doctor, okay? Uh, Preston from Sacramento, when do I know if I need oxygen supplement? Oh, supplemental oxygen? It's when your oxygen goes down below 88 and stays down there and it even goes down further and further and further. Um, when it's going down below a certain number, uh, we look at that as, okay, well, that person's oxygen is going down. It's chronically going down every single time that person moves. That person probably needs a lot of uh, more, needs supplemental oxygen. <coughs> to make the real determination, we do a blood gas and we do a six minute walk test on that person. We just confirm to see if it's a chronic issue. And if it's not a chronic issue, uh, we also might also do a pulmonary function test uh, screening uh, just to double check to see if there's something else happening. So uh, anybody can need supplemental oxygen. It all depends on the need for the body. If the body is, let's say somebody is normal, oxygen levels are at 87, 85%. And that can be the person's normal oxygen sats. That means that's not low for that person. That's, that, that's normal for that person. That determination is made by a pulmonologist. Okay, a pulmonologist make that determination. I mean, it could be made by a, uh, another physician, but it's usually made by a pulmonologist. All right, Donna from, um, from Iowa. Is there anything that works better for a rescue inhaler than albuterol sulfate, and do you recommend using it before exercise? <coughs> So, good morning. Uh, all right, Karen, you said my ideal volume is 1560. I can't seem to get past 1500. I know I, I'm, I'm answering this question. I just looked at that. Um, if you can't seem to get higher than 1500, then the technique is off. Uh, bring that up with your respiratory therapist uh, in the program and they will just tell them that you want to stay about five minutes after class. There's nothing wrong with doing that, you know, so um, just ask if, if you want to do a one-on-one -on -one session with your clinician, you can do that. So um, I hope that helps. Now from Donna from Iowa, uh, is there anything that works better than a rescue inhaler for albuterol sulfate and do you, rem do you recommend using it before exercise? So I'm assuming so there's a lot of things that jumps in my head when, when I read that out. First, are you using a rescue inhaler because you're out of breath? Because a rescue inhaler is not used for out of breath. A rescue inhaler is used when you're wheezing. A lot of people feel that when they're wheezing, they're out of breath. And that can be the case depending on how you feel. But albuterol sulfate is the one rescue inhaler that, um, that aggravates um, the alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 inside your system. Beta-2 is specifically lung, okay? Uh, you're looking at alpha-1 and beta-1, which is cardiovascular, okay? So when you take a rescue inhaler like albuterol, it will affect all those, okay? When you take something a little more synthetic, a little more specific, um, not saying albuterol is not specific, it's just not that, it attacks everything, okay? So you'll feel a lot of side effects, right? I mean, not a ton, but you'll feel some side effects. Um, all medications should be giving you some type of side effects. But um, if you had something more specific, let's say levalbuterol, which is more beta-2 specific, so it doesn't affect the alpha-1 and beta-1s, so it won't give you a lot, of, um, a lot of side effects at all. We usually give that type of medication, like Zopinex, to people that are kind of like allergic to albuterol. There isn't necessarily something that's better, but I'm curious if you're thinking, 
I need albuterol before I exercise because I get out of breath very quickly, or is it because you wheeze very quickly? If you wheeze very quickly, uh, Donna from uh, Iowa, like as soon as you start exercising, you wheeze, you might have a form of asthma, and, and specifically exercise-induced asthma. So I would do a provocational dose uh, of 20, um, meaning just let your doctor know that I would like to be tested for asthma. Um, but if it's just to decrease work of breathing, you just have to breathe throughout the exercise. It doesn't necessarily mean you need albuterol, but it won't hurt if you did it. You know, if it's time to take an albuterol treatment, nothing wrong with taking an albuterol treatment uh, before an exercise, just to be preventative, you know. Okay, now, rehab. Let's talk about the rehab, okay? When people enter into rehab, they're into our rehab. I'm not talking about every other rehab. I've governed about 75% of the rehab facilities in the tri-state area uh, when I first started out as a respiratory therapist. Um, so I governed Virginia, Maryland, and, uh, and D.C. And I have to tell you, um, there were some parts in Pennsylvania, but it wasn't a lot that I traveled to. Um, so with rehab, the first thing is we do first things first. Let's say phase one. Okay. A patient is admitted into our program by a referring doctor. The referring doctor can be your doctor. Um, if you don't have a doctor, uh, then we will um, uh, we'll work something out with a attending doctor that actually worked with you, that has knowledge of you. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll actually call that doctor specifically. So first, patient comes in, not physically, just calls us up. So we have a patient. Okay. Comes in for the first program and gets a, a consult with a doctor. So patient with pulmonologist. The next thing we have to verify, next thing we have to do is verify insurance, making sure your insurance is covering the program all the way and, and uh, letting you know if there's any, uh, anything with that. So we, we verify insurance before you start anything. And then we have to let you know exactly what your insurance is, um, um, you know, how many sessions you have left in your insurance, you know, uh, because it's 72 sessions. Uh, that's, that's the max you could do, 72 sessions. You can go over those sessions. Uh, the only thing is it, it, uh, the insurance uh, works a little differently, so we have to do things on our end, but I'm not a biller, so um, we verify insurance. Okay. We verify the insurance. Next. So meets with a pulmonologist. That pulmonologist will determine if you're severe enough to be in the program, like if you state that you can walk a mile, two miles, three miles, and they find out you have no lung disease, but you get a little winded, you're not going to be entered into the program. Okay. If you have uh, actual, uh, di uh, like an actual diagnosis of, uh, like, let's say, moderate to severe uh, or very severe lung disease like COPD, then, of course, you would be admitted into the program. You, you would actually qualify. So Dr. Shaw will do his qualification round, or the, one of our pulmonologists will do a qualification then we'll do an insurance verification. After that, an RT will do a care plan. In that care plan, we have to make sure that you understand um, everything in the program before you start. Now, mind you, you haven't started anything yet. All you did, you met with the pulmonologist, we verify insurance, you're good to go there. Then we do a care plan. Where well, care plans are based off of your complications. So we have to, it's all individualized. So what that means is that based off of your height, your you know, genetics, uh, your disease, we make a care plan based off of your complications, not everybody's, just yours. So we'll do like, what's your maximum heart rate levels, where they need to be at, uh, volumes, uh, lung volumes, where they're supposed to be at, you know, and, uh, and what we're gonna be working out and all that jazz. After that, then you start your first day with your assigned clinician in class. You pick the time that you want. Let's say you pick the 4 o'clock class. 
or maybe a 3 o'clock, and that's based off of Eastern Standard Time. So you meet with uh, first day of class, and then you'll go through uh, three types of phases in our program. The first phase is, I hate to say it like, uh, like this, but our first phase is where we teach you how to breathe. We uh, teach you the importance of exercise, also the uh, dietary. Um, we also have to teach you how to uh, breathe with certain exercises, like I mentioned, but respiratory muscle exercises. And uh, we'll go through techniques. And so the first week or two is just a lot of education. There is exercise, but it's very, very light. So it's very, very light in the first two weeks. After the first two weeks, the reason why we give that uh, that type of time is so people can be comfortable. We don't want people coming into our therapy sessions, you know, and just uh, that they have to, you know, jog for you know a mile or something. We we don't ever do something like that. We we start everybody very low at first. If um, let's say you have five people in a class, and uh, the assigned clinician like me. Uh, I will make the determination of how far everybody can walk. And what I do is I'll have everybody stand up. I'll also have everybody unmuted in the therapy because it's a telehealth program. So I'll have everybody unmuted and they will actually communicate with me and I'll, I'll say, how far can you walk before you have to stop? And then after I get all that data, I'll tell everyone to stand up and just walk in place. Okay. I might, and if, if I find one person that can't do it, that's my start point. Even though everybody else probably could do further, if I find, and I won't tell, tell everybody who that person is that I based off of the, the, the time, the starting time. So if I find that, uh, that one person, because there's no weak link in our chain, there's no weak link in our therapy program. So if I find one person that stops before everybody else, and that person stopped at five minutes walking in place or on a bike or anything like that, I will make the whole class start with five minutes. And not, no one will know that I base it off of this person. You know, I base it off worst case scenario because if everybody else can do 10 minutes but one person can only do less than five minutes, we're gonna start slow. We're gonna start at the five minutes where that person that wasn't doing, that, that can't do a lot at first, um, I'll work with that person individually sometimes, but uh, well, most of the time uh, I would do that at first if it's uh, depending on the complication. And um, so the first week is all education. Second week could be education, uh, but most likely after the second week, it's mandatory you have to work out. Okay. So I do that in my classrooms because I want people to be comfortable with what they're doing. I want them to understand the routines. I want them to understand how often they should be exercising, how long they should be exercising, how to manage their pulse rate, how to manage their pulse oximetry readings, everything. I mean, everything. So after the first week goes into the second week, then we go into a different phase. So after the second phase, class sizes, average class size I would say is about five to 10 on average, five to 10 depending. There are a lot of people like in my class, but on average, it's, it's about five to 10. I would say more realistically, it's 10 people in a therapy program, but even in a traditional facility, it's the same thing. There's a group of people, it's not one person all the time. It's, just, it's, it's always a group of uh, people. And usually the class sizes in a traditional facility is like eight to 15, all depends. And, um, but ours is about five to 10 on average, okay? So after the first phase, people are educated, they're tested. And it's not a written test, just a verbal test, you know. Uh, like, I'll, I'll bring up a question like this. Um, you see somebody working out, and they are getting very out of breath. They tell you and explain that they're getting very out of breath, but their oxygen looks fantastic, and their heart rate looks fantastic as well. What's the problem? And then I'll look at variation answers. but. The common answer is that person might be just out of shape, but there's nothing wrong with their lungs because oxygen's coming in, CO2 is coming out, uh, heart rate's not being elevated too much. You know, the person's just a little out of shape. You know, not a big deal. Uh, another question I could bring up is like, and let's see if anybody knows this answer. Okay, let's see if anybody knows this answer. 
How would I feel if I was dehydrated by 12%, meaning I lost 12% of my body weight from the water loss and evaporation? How would I feel? Would I feel lightheaded, dizzy? You know, how would I feel? So the answer to that is you wouldn't feel much because you'd be dead. <laughs> You'll be in a coma, you know, if not already dead. 12% um, is all you need to land in a coma, by the way. 2% dehydration loss, your balance is a little off. Uh, vision is starting to get blurry. Um, about 4% in, 4% uh, you're incredibly thirsty. Your uh, mouth is starting to get really dry, cotton mouth kind of uh, symptoms. Uh, you're starting to get really cold and you're gonna start walking on all fours. Meaning you can't stand up, your, your balance is completely off. Okay, around eight, you're, uh, you stop sweating. You're getting super cold and very, 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 very tired at 10, 12 percent, once you hit 12 percent dehydration, you're, uh, I'm sorry to say, you're a goner. <clears throat> so that's like a question I would bring up, you know. So I'll, I'll go over these questions, and um, if everyone does well, great. If, uh, if I see a couple of people that didn't do well, I'll make sure I bring up those, uh, you know, that, that class again uh, to talk about that subject so that person can be uh, um, aware of the answer. Um, th uh, about th uh, second month in, uh, everybody's usually, and mind you, these are people that probably couldn't do more than like 10, 15, 20 feet at first, you know. Second month in, a lot of people are usually at around 25 minutes uh, on their bike going around uh, about 7 to 11 miles per hour on their bike, which is this fast, roughly, okay. They're going about seven to 11 miles per hour. And so that's an RPE of around uh, about 2.5 to almost uh, four. Uh, RPE is rate of perceived exertion. <clears throat> so everybody in that class is usually up to about 25 minutes nonstop on the bike, okay? And they're walking, they're doing a lot more. Uh, I get results back from their pulmonologist about their uh, pulmonary function test. I'll explain the pulmonary function test readings to the patient if the doctor didn't explain the pulmonary function test uh, to that patient. And um, uh, basically, at the second month, I start looking at the, seeing if we're completing goals. Goals, like realistic goals, I'll write this up. You can't get, like, so goals are, are made up in the care plans. So, Let's look at goals really quick. Siri, I am not talking to you. Uh oh. Sorry. My watch responded. <laughs> Technology now. Uh, anyways, goals. Okay. I want to wean off oxygen. I want to wean completely off oxygen. That's one goal. Let's say another goal is I want to walk one mile before I have to stop. Very realistic, very realistic, both of these. Another goal is I want to increase my lung volumes. And that's to decrease the work of breathing. Another goal is I want to increase in my lung functions. Okay. These goals are realistic. Okay. The person probably when they first started is on maybe, you know, two to maybe six liters per minute on oxygen. Okay. just to kind of separate. So two to six liters of, uh, per minute on oxygen, probably a person has been on oxygen for, you know, maybe six years, four years, you know, whatever, uh, eight years, doesn't matter. So two to six liters of oxygen, then the person wants to be weaned off. Yes, that is realistic. A uh, person wants to walk a mile, but the person can only do 20 feet. Okay. One mile is realistic. Lung volumes, let's say the volumes uh, currently are 500 milliliters based off of your pulmonary function test and your incentive spirometry. You want to increase lung volumes to at least half 
of a max. And that's the calculation of 65 milliliters per kilogram body of body weight. Um, another goal is to increase lung functions. So I'm going to look at the FEV slash FVC and making sure there's an improvement in that. Um, how much it improves, it depends on how aggressive you are in your exercises. So if you're doing exercises and you can't do a lot, not a problem. Okay? The first things we do is we understand that you get out of breath very quickly. So we're not going to try to work you out and discourage you because you're exercising with us and you're getting out of breath quickly. It's just going to discourage you. First thing we do is, is work out your lungs a little bit. Get them up to be more compliant, more oxygen coming in, more CO2 coming out. Um, then we start working you on cardiovascular. We don't like to work people in cardiovascular at first. You know, we might do it as, on a test, you know, just, just to test it to see where your problem's at. But uh, we never start people out, everyone exercising first day of class, and we never do that. Uh, we have to educate the person. We have to also get the person's breathing to a, a better level before the person can start into more advanced classes. So the class in total, the whole time uh, in, is about 72 sessions. Um, and uh, uh, Medicare allows us to, uh, uh, like if you needed extended time, if you needed more time or something, uh, we, couldn't do, we can issue a modifier, but we have to look at medical necessity. So we would have to send a note out to your doctor, which happens all the time here. We send a note out to your doctor that you need to continue into therapy or any suggestions from your doctor. Do you want your patient to continue or do you feel your patient is good enough? You know? And then once we, ask or, well, once we obtain that correspondence, uh, we will talk to you, letting, your, letting you know your doctor uh, wants you to continue in therapy or feels like you're ready to, you know, you're good. And then you're out of the program, and then you get your life back. Have you heard of doctors prescribing uh, dope, uh, let's see, Dupexin, Dupexin for COVD patients? What do you think? I have to look more into that. Who is that? Uh, Karen, I, I have to look more into that. Um, I don't want to give a bad answer, so um, um, I am not 100% familiar with that one. I'm going to be very honest. Um, Dupexin sounds very familiar, but I would have to look at my, uh, my manual to see that medication, look at the side effects and everything. Um, but uh, I'll look more into that and give you a better answer. Let's see, Lynn, I started the application process with you, and before I got, it, uh, uh, let's see, before I got any information on it, my insurance would cover my participation. I got a text saying I needed to set up a consultation with Dr. Shaw. I didn't follow through because I was worried that rehab would not be covered for me and didn't want to end up with all that. Um, the consultations, uh, so we work just like a doctor's office because we are a doctor's office. So if you, anytime you go in, it's not like you're getting billed for all these things. It, we, don't, we don't do that. Um, you get uh, the insurance is, you know, the insurance covers the program. So. So the company is very smart. If they see that you have this insurance, and let's say you had a secondary insurance, most of the time billing will already know that it's covered, you know, automatically. You know, so if they're bringing you in for a consultation, then it's covered. But um, yeah, I wouldn't actually worry about that, Lynn. I would uh, definitely follow through. The worst thing you could ever do is not follow through to something that can actually fix your life. It's different if we just enhance it just a little bit. Okay, but we're talking about an actual program that actually does justice. Okay, if you're looking for a program that actually does well, yes. So, Lynn, no worries, but I wouldn't be worried. I'll follow through. Okay. Um, the cover is one of the bills. Say, please tell me what, uh, at what point I will get confirmation my insurance will. Um, all you have to do, Lynn, is just contact us uh, on, on billing. Just contact billing. You just contact us and ask them you want to talk to billing, and uh, they'll just see it right then and there. So um, I would definitely do that. Okay. I need this so much, and I can't afford any medical IOU on my fixed low income. No worries, Lynn. I, you know, the, these programs are 
There's a lot of good programs, uh, but we know where we stand on on success rates, you know, because that's that's all we ever do in here is pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation. But don't be worried about things like that. Um, we understand people's, uh, you know, uh, uh, problems, and and we also have solutions to those. So we can always work something out. Okay. So just hang in there, Lynn. But uh, definitely call us today, and just to just ask them to talk to Billing, and just make sure that you're. You get verification that it's um, everything's covered. Okay, no worries. With billing, I see. Okay, now the question on rehab and tips. Okay, question on rehab and tips. Uh, replying to Lynn Burroughs, thank you ever so much. We'll follow through today. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. Um, when starting out a rehab program, you want to pick a, uh, let's say, you want to do some rehab in your own home, right? Because that's what we do, right? Um, of course, it's done through telehealth, virtually, where the clinician can see and hear you at every moment you, you, you're there. You know, just like you being in physically. It's, it's what we call real time, okay? So the clinician can see and hear you, and... Um, in the uh, therapy program, of course, it's like I mentioned in 72 sessions. And um, yeah. So with, uh, let's say I want to start out an exercise routine. Uh, the first thing I would do is, uh, if I was going to do it by myself, which is not what I would recommend, I would recommend, you know, finding out routines that is best suited for you, because that's what we study for. We study to to uh, to look at the person as a whole as an individual and base the care plan, the therapy exercise prescription based off of you. So if you try to do it blindsided, you might get injured. So the safest thing I could say is if you're going to try to do it yourself at home, you have to know what your maximum heart rate is, and that's 220 minus your age, and then you want to be at 40 to 80 percent of that max. Second, you want to know your maximum lung volume. What is your body capable of bringing into your, into your lungs? Like how much air, the volume of air, how much of that can come into your lungs? And where are you currently? Okay. Once I do that, once I figure out that, then we'll figure out, look at uh, any other complications. Do you have a bad hip? Do you have a bad back? Do you have a bad neck? Do you have you know, something else? Do you have diabetes? Do you have this and that? Because we, every therapy program has to be orchestrated, specifically catered to you. Okay, one program is not for 100,000 people. Now, respiratory muscle training should always be done by everybody. You know, cardio training could be done in a group. That's, that's easy to do, you know, because everyone's doing the same thing, but everybody works out in their own, uh, their, uh, their own prescription, right? So you would have to know what your maximum heart rate is, maximum lung volume. You want to start with uh, those problems. So if your volume isn't high, respiratory muscle training. Um, if you have a lot of congestion, removal of congestion. If you have problem with wheezing uh, and you have bad, uh, you know poor medications or compliance with your medication, maybe you have a problem with your CPAP, uh, your PAP device, you know your sl sleep apnea machine. Maybe you have problems with compliance with that. Um, I would have to know that information before I can orchestrate a proper exercise program. But the exercise program, nonetheless, would be three and fives, three sets, five repetitions. You would divide the body into half. You will do two days upper trunk, two days lower trunk, okay? Meaning I would work out, let's say I'll work out my chest, um, I'll work out my chest, my arms, my shoulders one day, and maybe on that same day I'll, I'll try to do some calves. Next day I'll, I'll devote straight to legs. Next day I'll do some abdominals. Three and fives mean three sets, five repetitions. And then I will increase that, you know, perpetuate the timing and the resistance. So if you started with a three pound weight and after about a week, uh, three pounds feels very light, I'll go to four pounds and slowly increase the weight as we go. Okay. And the more increase, there is a cap on it, meaning um, once you're at about 30 minutes on the bike going around seven to 11 miles per hour with no problems breathing, no problems that, that's all you have to really maintain yourself. You know, if you can do 30 minutes a day, on exercise, it's pretty simple to do. I mean, if you ever have a pedometer, put a pedometer on you and, and just don't even worry about anything. Just be in your home, 
do the activities you usually do on a daily basis and see how many steps do you put in on a, uh, per day. And if you're at 2,000 steps, then that's a mile right there. There you go, you know. So activities, you know, making the bed, doing dishes, doing laundry, uh, doing gardening, anything like that is still considered an exercise. And remember, what's a good uh, exercise? Something to increase your heart rate by what? 10 beats. The other thing you want to do is also find the exercise that you will do for the long term. Okay. Let's say walking is not your favorite. Then you wouldn't pick it. Okay. Good exercise. But let's say you didn't want that one. You just have to, we would have to pick an exercise that you could do that you enjoy doing. And we'll change it up. Let's say you don't like riding the bike alone. So you'll, we'll probably add in some music to it. You know, different things to make it more enjoyable. Uh, but uh, yeah, we base the exercise off of you, but um, you have to pick an exercise that you could do that's affordable, that you can do at home, you can do it when you're 80 or 90 years old, that uh, uh, there isn't a lot of complications with it, like the possibilities of injury is very, very low. Good exercise to pick, right? Something that you enjoy doing, something that increases your heart rate, has a benefit, you know, like what's the benefit off of uh, biking? Well, it helps the heart, it helps with depression, it helps with diabetes, it helps with a lot of other things. You know, there's, uh, I mean, if you could take exercise and put it into a pill form, it would be the best pharmaceutical agent to date, you know, because it literally fixes a lot. So um, that's the best I can do as far as tips and tricks. Now, uh, as we do more of these videos, these live feeds, I'll bring up some. Would that be okay with everybody? Well, when we first start out, I'll bring up an exercise we'll do together, and then I'll go into the topics. You want me to do that? Let's put a vote to it. Uh, I need at least five yeses. Please. If you want me to do an exercise, just a simple exercise, in the beginning of these live feeds, just say yes. Okay, I got one. I got two. I got three. I got four, I got five, I got six. Anybody else? Yes, okay, it looks like you got, I got 10. <laughs> All right, I got 11. <laughs> okay, so as we put it to a vote, everybody, that's exactly what I'm gonna do then. So in the beginning, let's say uh, starting on Thursday, I'm gonna bring up a small exercise in the beginning of the live feeds, okay? And it will be about five to 10 minutes um, it'll be five to 10 minutes and I'll let you know exactly what you'll need for that day. Um, so let's, let's do Thursday. Okay. We'll start this on Thursday. Is that okay with everybody? So let's start this on Thursday. What I'll do is right now I can do it on top of my head. So I can do it on top of my head. Thursday, I'm going to need two weights of equal weight. So it could be soup cans, water bottles, uh, therapy bands, free weights, up to five pounds. Uh, we'll start with that. So uh, please wear comfortable clothing. Make sure you have your pulse oximeter with you, and we'll start this on Thursday. Remember, they're only 10-minute sessions, okay? So they're only going to be 10 minutes, but I'll do it the first 10 minutes on our live feeds. I'll do a 10-minute exercise. It could be stress management. Uh, and if you have topics or exercises you want me to do, just share them on the comment section and I'll be, if there's a lot of people that want to do respiratory muscle training, then I'll bring that up as, as our 10 minute session. If you want to do cardio training, if I only get a lot of feedback on this, then I'll just make it up myself, meaning I will do Thursday as cardiac. Uh, but this Thursday that's coming up, it's going to be with weights. Okay, I'll just, I'll start it off. So some weight training, very light, Nothing too aggressive. Okay, very light, nothing too aggressive, but we'll start that on Thursday. Am I going to see everybody back on Thursday? RMT, please. <laughs> I'll bring that up. That's not a problem. I'll bring, I'll bring that up. This Thursday, uh, it's going to be weight training. So as part of the weight training, I'll also include respiratory muscle training since that is considered weight training. Okay. Um, if you can do me a favor, can everybody do me a big favor in here? I see there's a lot of people on here. Can you just guys just do me one hot favor? Okay, let uh, share this or share the announcement to all your friends if you can. 
just and especially people that have a hard time breathing because this is stuff that is helpful for them you know so if you have if you find anybody you know like on your facebook on your facebook page on your own personal account just kind of share our link um to your friends and just let it let people know because the more the merrier and there's a lot of people out there that they don't even know about us they don't even know what hrn stands for it stands for the home rehab network um it would be very 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 helpful uh, especially for them. I mean, you look at it this way, you're going to be helping them tremendously. Uh, so if you can do that for me, uh, for me, and also if you have time, if you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram, just look, just type in on the search on Instagram or Twitter uh, on Home Rehab Network and follow us on that, and uh, if you can, on YouTube as well. But um, other than that, share all the time. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that need our help. And we're, we're trying to oblige, okay? We're, we're doing the best we can with that. So uh, that would be very helpful. Any, anyways, guys, that's it. I'll see you guys back on Thursday. Free weights up to five pounds. You can use soup cans, water bottles, anything like that. And I'll see you guys later. See ya.